okay? Uh, for, uh, this is uh, some of the work I'm going to describe by the group. Uh, there is a very strong team at Princeton under the MIRF program. It's an NSF program. This is some of the work that Professor V. Saki, Titel, and Curl have been doing. And basically, you know, nitric oxide is a major atmospheric pollutant. We all know that. It's very interesting. It's paramagnetic, so you can use uh, ultra-sensitive Faraday rotation uh, spectroscopy. So they put together a cryogenic uh, free system uh, with external cavity QCL, as I described before. They achieved the detection limit of four parts per billion in volume with one second in uh, uh, integration time. And in fact, this shows over several days of uh, uh, the Olympic Games, before the Olympic Games in uh, uh, Beijing, okay, the, uh, in time, the, uh, the shows the signal of uh, N of N of N of N O. Basically, you are going from a day of clear skies to a day that you can have a lot of uh, pollution and so forth. So you can measure down to low level at, a, at extremely low, low noise with uh, very high sensitivity. The same uh, uh, basically uh, related uh, team led by Professor Macho uh, did measurement of ozone also at, uh, uh, the, at the Olympic Games in uh, uh, Beijing. Again, here you have an external cavity QCL as described before. There is this box that I showed you. There is a, a telescope here with a round trip of around 70 uh, 75 meters, and uh, they have detected these uh, chemicals. So again, the spectroscopy is going very strong, a study of the environment and so forth. This is the work of a breath sensor. This is the group of uh, uh, Frank Tittel and Bob Curl. In fact, I think that's Bob Curl himself uh, uh, testing this breath, uh, uh, breath uh, um, analysis. You have to realize in human breath there are about 400 trace gases, so you want a technique uh, in fact, uh, that is very sensitive, and this is basically photoacoustic spec uh, spectroscopy using a uh, T cool. This is the box from daylight solution that I mentioned before an external cavity control, a QC laser. Now, our uh, uh, approach has been a bit different. We want, we want to try to make a non ship compact spectrometer where we can uh, address a large number of wavelengths either simultaneously or in any order. So we simply, my students, what they did, they built on a chip different distributed feedback laser with different uh, 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 gratings. So now you have all this comb of uh, uh, laser wavelengths and you have to you, you separate them so that you can fill them by temperature tuning. And you have a microcontroller and what we did actually, we uh, wanted to show the following. How can this compete with a Fourier transform interferometer, which is a box like this, and you know, it uses thermal sources. So well, first we put together this box with everything. You see this shows a laser emits, uh, can emit in any order of time or simultaneously 32 different wavelengths. Okay, so this is 32 laser. And then we did the spectrum of standard liquids compare them to a Fourier transform in, uh, in uh, interferometer spectra, and they're all here. Uh, you see they overlap pretty well. In fact, uh, we got Brucker kind of interested, and we are collaborating with uh, uh, um, Brucker Optics to see what we can do. Maybe in, in the future, push it into, into actually the real world. And I think this is a very interesting application because you can make a high brightness uh, uh, spectrometer so you can do uh, really re remote sensing. Short wavelength QCLs are a challenge, but the idea is very basically this. Okay, what you need to do is to, is to um, use deep quantum wells, but it's not enough actually. If you want to go at a three micron, it is not enough to use aluminum indium arsenide. Simply you don't have enough range, even if you use strain. You can use strain compensation and do other tricks, but it doesn't quite work. So why not use this very interesting heterostructure? What you can grow is indium gallium arsenide, very famous alloy for electronics, for photonics, lattice match to indium phosphate for the quantum wells. And for the energy barriers, you can use the aluminum arsenide and timonide. So you can have now a huge discontinuity. 
Yeah, this is all nice. In fact, this is works interesting. But there is a but, you see. It's the band structure. Okay, a solid state physicist uh, know that there are so-called satellite valleys in the band structure. The way I like to see it, that you can have scattering. If you are a sufficient energy, you can have scattering to high effective mass states. Uh, if you like, I call them dark states, because when the uh, uh, electron is there, it's lost from the point of view of emitting a photon. Okay, so if you use uh, this system here, lattice match, and so forth, and if you're trying to make a laser at three micron, the upper laser states is actually ab ab above the energy of these dark states. So lasing will be very hard. So you have to do uh, something different, and here I wanted to talk about the beautiful work of the group of University of Sheffield, they're going to be highlighted at this conference, I think tomorrow, where they got around it by, using st by adding strain to that structure and essentially putting more indium in the quantum wells, you can push those dark states higher in, in, in energy, basically, and get lasing. And so these are, uh, this is the energy band diagram, and this is a first uh, for... Uh, 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 a quantum cascade uh, a laser, they were able to uh, essentially at around 3.3 micron wavelengths to achieve uh, up to a watt per facet uh, peak power at uh, uh, room temperature. And you can go to this talk here if you're interested. This is the peak optical power in watts as a function of current. Now there is competition, of course, at short wavelengths. And I've just learned uh, recently, in fact, there is competition from antimony-based diode laser at 3 micron. Recent result, a group at Stony Brook uh, of 300 milliwatts of uh, power, continuous wave, now not pulse, continuous wave at, uh, at room temperature with very low threshold. So there is competition as you start to get very close to 3 micron. Okay. The interbank cascade laser is an interesting concept. It's not a unipolar laser. There are electrons and holes, but it uses the cascading uh, per process, and this has been pioneered by a number of people, Young, uh, uh, Chairman, uh, Jerry Meyer, and so forth. The idea is essentially using band engineering, you can have the electrons tunnel in this so-called W active shape, active region, where the electron can recombine with an with a actual hole, and then it emits a photon, but then can tunnel out, you see, into the next stage. So you can have recombination and still ca uh, cascading if you do this band engineering. And these are some of the results that they obtain, which are certainly very interesting. These are CW at room temperature, 20, 30 milliwatts of power, 3.65 micron wavelength. Now I want to move and conclude, essentially talk about the terahertz. You know, the terahertz is a very interesting region, but they are not uh, quite uh, there. QCL in terms of temperature, although we have very interesting results. Now you realize when you are at, uh, uh, at these long wavelengths, you can't ask the crystal goer to use a thick dielectric. They'll shoot you, okay? And you can't ask, grow me 30 micron of uh, uh, material. So you have to use a metallic waveguide, essentially a surface plasmon waveguide, essentially. What you have is the reactive region that is embedded between two metals, so you can have high confinement factor. Of course, you have a lot of diffraction. It's a sub-wavelength ap ap aperture, so there are some problems. Or you can use a, a one-metal one structure. Now, how do you do the population inversion? Well, this doesn't work. Okay, this energy here, the red arrow, is only maybe 5, 10 MeV. Even if you emit an optical phone, on the lifetime of those two upper states are too close to get good population inversion. So you have to use a trick like this. Essentially, you want to tunnel into a nearby state, and there you, you, you can emit an optical phone. 